Hi, I'm Bob with JD Squared. Thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to be cutting this six inch pipe right here. It has an OD of six and five eighths with a quarter inch wall. We're going to be cutting that on an XR6 rotary cutter. Everything I talk about also pertains directly to XR12s. The tooling just looks a little bit different. Now, in prior videos, I had cut some pretty large pipe. I just cut some eight and five eighths inch OD, which is eight inch pipe. I think that's schedule 80, had a half inch wall on it. I cut that and I've also, in a previous video, showed you how to operate the automatic uh, round tube stabilizer and we were cutting like inch and a quarter pipe, inch and a half pipe. In this video, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Obviously, six inches different, but what we're gonna do, we're gonna cut both ends of this pipe and we're gonna see how much waste do I have. Now, as you well know, I'm not a big fan of Pinocchio machines. Those are the ones where the tube feeds out. Now, I'm not putting down any manufacturers. I built one myself sitting right there. And after we got it done, I hated everything about it. It's probably one of the world's best cutters. I just, it just wasn't very practical. And this is the reason why, is because when you feed out the pipe, you've got leverage on it. We can't cut very near the end. I want to be able to cut within like an inch and a half of the end of the pipe. Now, the XR6 being a traveling head machine is going to allow me to do that. Now, what I'm going to do is I will be describing to you the tooling plate sets. And this is what I'm holding in my hand. Every XR6 or XR12 is provided free of charge with the machine, a range of tooling plates. Now, they handle everything from flat steel to channel if you don't want to rotate it and they handle round tube and pipe. The standard set will take you up to about eight inches. This one here, for instance, has got a three on it, which means typically the three inch is the largest size that I wanna put into this plate right here. Now, I will be describing a little more detail here, the tooling plate, what the principle of operation is. After that, we will load the tubing or the pipe into the machine then I will go back to my office. We will use Inventor to quickly create a simple part, and then we will process it in our software, Camelot. We'll bring it back out here to the factory floor, and we'll cut it at the end of the video. If you're not interested in Camelot at all, just skip through that. The only reason I do it is people like to see the entire process, so I want to do that. So anyway, without further ado, let's get after it. Let's talk about the principle of operation. I have chosen a seven inch round roller plate right here, which means typically um, anything in that range, seven inches and a little bit below it, maybe down to around six inch or whatever, I will typically choose this plate up until the, pa the part becomes so small that it contacts this arc down here, then you know you're gonna have to go to the next smaller plate and we do supply a range of these with the machine. Now, on the bottom of these, there's a square groove cutout. These have been precision laser cut and the idea is we're going to place these roller plates onto the tooling rail in the machine. Now, the entire frame of the XR machines has been CNC machined. These are precision laser cut. So by doing this, once we put them in there, if we put multiple adapters in there or roller plates, then we know for a fact that once we load the pipe on them, it is perfectly square and straight with the machine. Everything works great. Well, that means your tubing is going to be sitting at a certain height. At that point, all we have to do is adjust the power head up or down, slide it in or out if we need to, and we bring the chuck to the pipe instead of the pipe to the chuck, which is what a lot of machines out there do. Now, the way they accomplish that is they have individual arms or adjustable um, transfer balls or rollers or whatever that go down the whole machine. And you go down and you individually uh, adjust all these things. Well, that's a real pain in the butt because if it's a machine that they're not synchronized, some of the high dollar ones, you know, you get up to six figures, they're synchronized. For instance, the 24 inch model that we're gonna be bringing out next year uses that principle, but it's all servo driven. They're all fully automatic to prevent this problem. But anyway, if you have a machine that's got individual adjustable rollers, you have to adjust every roller all the way down this tube. Now let's just say you've got 
six of these adapters in the machine. That means you'd have to adjust 12 rollers individually. But here's where the problem comes in. You've also got to make sure as you adjust these rollers, the pipe stays in the middle of the machine. If it's off to one side, your cut's not going to be accurate. By us going to this system right here, we always know the pipe is perfectly square. We should never have any dimensional errors after we get done cutting. So let's go ahead and I'm going to be loading the pipe into the machine. I'm going to be taking out the tube stabilizer. Now, a lot of people ask me questions, how long does it take you to do stuff? So I'm going to go ahead and videotape this process right here. I might speed it up in a couple areas. I don't know. It doesn't take me very long, but I will be explaining what I do as I do it. If you don't want to see me load it, just skip forward to the next section. Since I've been cutting small tube using the automatic stabilizer, the first thing I need to do is go ahead and remove it from the machine. Let's see. Alrighty. I have to remove, unplug my pneumatic hoses over here. Let's go ahead and using the provided plugs, I will plug those holes up so we don't get any debris into the air system. Alrighty. Remove the bolts. And that's it. So this is the automatic round tube stabilizer. It's out of the machine. Let me just set it right here. All righty. Now, what I want to do is go ahead and place my roller plate with the rollers into the machine. I am going to place it right here. I measured the pipe. It's seven feet, four inches long. So I've got this out about five and a half feet long. Using the 12 millimeter bolts, I'm going to go ahead and tighten them down. Let me run it up a little bit. Now these plates do not have to be bolted into the machine. They could also very easily be vice gripped into the machine. In fact, when we designed the entire coolant recovery tray, it was designed to make sure we had enough room to put a pair of vice grips in it because we don't know where you're going to put these. Supposing, even though there's two ways you can flip this, it could be that you're cutting something and you need to move this somewhere where there isn't a hole in the tooling rail. You can almost vice grip it. So we've got this one in the machine right here. Let's go ahead and zip it on down. There we go. Now, we're going to take another one, but this time I'm not going to put the bearings in it. We're going to mount this one relatively close to the chuck right here. And the idea is when the part cuts off, it's going to drop into this V right here. And there you go. Now, um, whoop, let's go ahead and hit that real quick. There we go. So it'll drop into that. We don't really want to put rollers out here because we're going to let the chuck support one end of the pipe. Now, real quick before I forget it, there's other ways to cut pipe in this machine. Let's just say you wanted to cut absolutely as close to the end of this pipe as possible. I don't know, maybe you're using some high dollar stainless steel. Then we go to what we call the drive shaft solution. And we have plates that we make that will grab the ID of the pipe and they have these universal joint of them they come from like caterpillar tractors uh, the power takeoffs and we'll have a drive shaft that will drive that now we can cut extremely close to the end of the pipe if that inch or inch and a half financially makes a difference to you all right let me go ahead and i am going to move the pipe into position i'm on the forklift and i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to bring the pipe in and what I'm doing is I've got it to where we're just going to be a few inches in front of the chuck. Now I can go ahead and lower it down onto the bearings. Let me see. Okay. Lower a little bit more. Now once I've done that, let me go ahead and kill the motor. And I'm going to walk around and I am going to remove my vice grips or um, my clamps that I had put onto it to prevent the... <laughs> to prevent the pipe from rolling off the forks. Let me go ahead and I'll get this one right here too. All right, let's see. Okay, there we go. All right, looks good. We're on the roller. Let me go ahead and back the forklift out of, the, out of position. All 
Okay, you can see that I've got the pipe loaded just a little bit in front of the chuck. Why would I want to do that? Why did we design the head to move up and down and in and out? Okay, imagine that you loaded up a 24 foot piece of this pipe. Well, how are you going to side shift it? You're going to get a forklift to push on one end and move it? Very hard to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring the chuck to the pipe instead of the pipe to the chuck. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put this level on top of the plate here. And what it's showing is that I'm ever so slightly low on this end compared to the other end. Now, that makes sense because, remember, the bearings aren't there. We're actually sitting in the V. So after this thing gets done cutting, that's where it's going to fall. It's going to fall into that V right here. So let me go ahead and walk around the other side of the machine. We have a 19-inch wrench that we are going to break loose the lock bolt on the back. I will put a picture up so that you can see what I'm talking about. We are also going to use a 19 millimeter socket and there are two 12 millimeter nuts on the back of the power head and we are also going to loosen them right there too. Alrighty. In order to adjust the system up or down, I've got an adjustable wrench right here, and there's a large nut that we call the vertical adjustment nut on the back side. You'll see it in the picture that I'm going to be adjusting. So here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to slide the chuck in towards the pipe, and I'm going to grab it from the inside, not the outside. Remember, it doesn't matter where you grab it. Now, when I do that, that means I've got to open the jaws instead of close the jaws. Now, as I open them up, they're going to take the tube, all right, they've got the load of the tube or pipe is now on the jaws. In fact, I don't know if you saw it in the video, I've actually lifted off of this V-plate. I'm already off it. Um, and you can see I didn't really put out a whole lot of effort. So let's take a look at our, okay, we're going to need to come down just a hair on this side right here. Now as I do that, um, the idea was when I designed this, I'm trying to make everything as easy as possible to do. Um, ooh, that's not bad. Let's go a little bit more. Now, one thing I am going to do is I am going to adjust it in order to have this end of the pipe ever so slightly above that end because I want my coolant to run down the pipe. And maybe a little bit more. Let's see here. All right. Now, by the way, this doesn't take any force, what I'm doing. This is extremely easy. Um, oh, yeah, that's not looking bad. We're going to go with that right there. At that point, I am now going to take my 19 millimeter socket, and I'm going to tighten up those two bolts that I told you about, the, the lock bolts on the rear. So that's one, and that's two. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take my 19 millimeter wrench, and I'm going to lock the power head into position, and that will make sure that it can't slide this way. All right, one more check on our pipe to make sure we're nice and tight, and we're good. That was all that it took to put this pipe into the machine. So why don't we do this? Let's head on back to my office, create a quick program, and then we'll get our butts back out here and we'll cut this bad boy. I'm going to go ahead and quickly create a part here in Autodesk Inventor. That's the CAD program that um, I prefer to use. I've used them all. Solid, well, not all of them. SolidWorks, Fusion, Inventor. And I really, really like Inventor. I know it's a, it's a six inch pipe. It's 280 thousandths wall thickness with an OD of five, uh, six and five eighths of an inch. Now, the reason I'm doing this right here, let's go ahead and extrude that actually into a pipe is because even though I've done this and doggone near every video I've made, um, there's a lot of people that haven't seen me do it. So I just want them to see the entire process. If you've seen me do this, just skip forward. Um, there's nothing new under the sun right here. I'm just kind of like making up a part. Um, if you haven't, I'm not really trying to teach you Inventor. I'm just um, using Inventor. Anyway, I've measured the pipe out there. It's 87 and 7 eighths of an inch long. I'm going to go ahead and extrude this pipe out to 86 inches long in order to um, 
give us about an inch and a half material at the chuck end of the of the part so that when we cut we don't actually cut into the chuck um, so it should be pretty close so we, we're gonna we, we'll have about inch and seven eighths of material that we're gonna scrap in this operation anyway that's our pipe right there let's go ahead and add uh, I don't know let's just add a couple of features just so that it's not so doggone boring looking I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna go to view slice my graphics and now I got to go back to sketch mode. I'm going to project my geometry. I am planning on doing some videos uh, using Fusion 360 because if you've ever come into the factory here, um, a lot of people I talk to don't really have a 3D CAD program that they're using. I do not recommend, if you don't have a CAD program, I do not recommend that you use something like a 2D program, for instance, like AutoCAD or or draft site or something like that um whoops i extruded that what i really want to do is cut it okay there's our first slot um the reason is is because it's very easy to make corrections of what i'm doing right here i'm going to go ahead and array that feature around the end of the pipe four times and that's what we have right there now what i want to do to make it interesting also i'm going to take those features and i am going to mirror them to the other side of the pipe also. So now we have them on both sides of the pipe. What I wanna do now is I'm gonna put a fillet on all those edges. It looks like an eighth inch is what uh, Autodesk is defaulted to. I can live with that. And I've gotta select them individually. Now, if you are a CAD CAM program user, you're wondering why didn't I do this before I mirrored those slots? And the reason is that I've run into this exact same problem with SolidWorks, uh, no experience with Fusion when it comes to doing this. It turns out a lot of times when you go to mirror something, these programs don't really care uh, to mirror a fillet. And sure enough, when I tried this earlier, Inventor said, no, I don't like it. Anyway, I have 16 edges here. I'm going to say, okay. And there you go. Now, the reason I put a fillet in is whenever you're plasma cutting, laser cutting, or whatever, you generally want to fill it all sharp edges. And that gives the, um, the laser, or in our case, the XR6, uh, a little more smoother path to follow so it doesn't have to slow down so doggone much. So keep that in mind. Whenever you can fill it a sharp edge, go ahead and do that. There we go. Earlier this morning, a gentleman called and wanted to know if we could just shoot him a video showing the XR6 cutting a larger size of pipe um, and put some slots and some simple holes in it. Nothing major. He just wants to see kind of like how it looks. So we're going to go ahead and take this opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to cut on both ends of the pipe. Now we're going to go ahead and put this slot. What I need to do is, um, or what my thinking is, is I'm going to put that slot right here. So let's go ahead and create a plane, uh, an angle plane around an edge. And the plane I'm going to choose is the top plane. And the edge I'm going to choose is that there. And I'm going to set it at 45 degrees. So there we go there. Now, let's go ahead and create our sketch onto that plane. I'm going to need to slice my graphics so I can see what I'm doing. Go back to sketch. I'm going to project some geometry right here and I am going to make a slot. Now, we need to go ahead and dimension where we want this slot to be. So we're gonna cut it in about three quarters of an inch. Yeah, I think that might work. And we're gonna make this slot three quarters of an inch wide. And I think that'll be good. I'm, I'm hoping this is what he's looking for. And we're gonna make it one and a quarter of an inch wide. Now, I have to tell it Notice I got a little purple and black. Whenever you're working with a CAD program right there, that means it's not fully defined. Now it's all black, whether it's SolidWorks or Inventor, it's fully defined. In fact, right here in the lower right corner, you can see where it says fully defined. So let's go ahead and do that. And as I did before, I am going to go ahead and cut that part into the tubing. All right, there's our first slot. Let me go ahead and hide this plane right here. That's going to be our slot our first one right there. Now, let's go ahead and mirror that also. So we pick the extrusion. I'm gonna hit mirror. And the plane I'm gonna pick is this one right here. And there's our hot hole on the other side. Okay, so that's our two slots. 
He also asked for a couple holes, so let's go ahead and do that. And basically, we're going to do it the same way. We're going to angle to plane around edge, and our edge is going to be the y-axis, and the plane will once again be that one. However, this time, I think we're going to go minus 45 degrees. Yep, that's exactly what I want. Now, let's go ahead and rotate around over here, and we're going to create a new sketch onto that plane there. As you saw me do earlier, I am going to slice my graphics, and I'm going to go back to sketch mode, and I am going to project some geometry. Let's go ahead and pop in a one-inch diameter hole, a little bit larger. Let's go 1.030. Uh, in fact, you know what? This is a couple times Inventor's done that to me. Let me go ahead and dimension the edge first. Um, you know, 0.8 doesn't look bad, does it? Um, now let's go ahead and punch this in at 1.030 inches. And once again, we will tell it that from here to, I'm sorry, we want it to be left from here to here. There you go. It's all black. Once again, it's fully constrained. But I got to tell you, I don't know if I'm a huge, huge fan of this 0 0.8. Let's, let's go a little bit larger. How about we go to one inch further away from that edge? Um, yeah, I like that a lot. That looks good. Now, this time, instead of mirroring it like I did before, and I'm just showing you tricks and all in CAD programs, trying to talk you into buying a 3D CAD program if you don't already have one. Let's go ahead and um, hide the visibility there. This time, we are going to cut this hole, but this time we're going to cut it through all ends right there instead of mirroring it. Anyway, that is our part. That's what we're going to take out there to cut. Now, what I need to do in Inventor is come up here to File, Export as CAD Format, and Camelot needs to see a step file. That's a common 3D file that programs can exchange 3D information with. So it's already picked up the name, pipe six inch, both ends is what I'm calling it because that's what we're doing. And we're going to go ahead and save that. And if I look in my Explorer, there's my pipe. Um, let me see. Oops. Let's get up here. There it is right there. That's my step file that we're going to be working with right now. All right. Now, let's go ahead and move into Camelot. I've gone ahead and started up Camelot right here. I want to drag this up here so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to be dragging that step file we just created into the Camelot window. Yes, I want to detect features. And yes, I want to make a job. Now, a job is what we're going to make or use to create the G-code to head out to the machine. So right now, it's doing a process called normalization. It's, it's calculating all of the cut paths or the surfaces that it's going to need to cut this pipe out. Now, it's asking me for a name. Remember I Control-Z copied earlier? That was pretty much why. I'm going to go ahead and name this job, this right here. So we're going to say Save. And there's the job right there. I go ahead and drag this out of the way now. Now we have a job. The next thing we're going to look at right here was I noticed that I'm cutting the slots on the far end. Well, this is the end that the chuck is in. I don't really want to do it there. So what I'm going to do is I am going to reverse the start end. Give it a second here. It's basically flipping all of the geometry right now, and there you go. Now we have all the geometry on this end, which is precisely what I want. Let's go ahead and close that. The next step is let's come along and create the operations that we're going to need. Now notice there's three layers. There's a start layer, there's a hole layer, and then on this other end, let me zoom, is the end layer. So this will be the end furthest from the chuck. Let's go ahead and click the plus button in operation. Select my consumables. Camelot has no idea what consumables you're going to cut it with, so you got to tell it. 65 amp shielded, and we're going to make an operation for all layers. I could make the operations independently, but we do have the one button to make them all. There we go. Now we have all our operations, and if we zoom in, you can see that it's calculated all the cuts. You can see it's offset the, the proper kerf width the whole bit. Okay, now we're going to need to go ahead and nest this tube. We don't care how long Camelot thinks this tube is. It makes no difference. We could put any number in as long as we put it in larger than the, the length of the part. I'm going to go ahead and put it in as 
88 inches long because that's what we did measure it. However, I could have just left it alone. It wouldn't have mattered. Let's go ahead and hit nest. Now, there's our chuck and there's our part. So it's giving you a rough idea how far out it's going to be. This is not dimensionally perfect. We're just trying to give you a visual aid of what's going to happen. Okay, we can go ahead and close this. We run our post, post processor by clicking this button in the upper left. And we're going to go ahead and it suggests the name, pipe, six inch, both ends. And we're going to say save. Okay, now if I drag my window back over, this is the file here with the extension .ngc that I am going to go ahead and drag and drop this to a USB drive and I'm going to take it out to the machine and we'll cut it. I'll see you out there. We're back out at the machine. I've gone ahead and put the USB drive into the computer right here. There are now three things that we have to do before we can actually load and cut that pipe. The first one is we're going to want to alter the home position of the machine. So for instance, if I was to bring the head, oh, let me get on my program, bring the head on down, notice it stopped well short of the end of the pipe right there. And it did that because we had the stabilizer in the machine. In fact, it was right here. So you could see we had it adjusted very near the chuck. We're going to want to relocate the homing bracket on the rear of the machine. Now, I've done that in a previous video when I was cutting the 8-inch pipe. I'm sorry, when I was actually showing the round tube stabilizer, I showed you every step of it. I'm not going to do that in this video. You're going to see me adjusting it and I'll describe what I'm doing, but I'm not gonna really uh, show many um, close-up video shots of me doing it. Check out the homing video or how to set home on the XR machines and you'll have a little more detailed idea how to do it. It's super, super simple. The second thing we need to do is we're gonna have to tell the machine that we've got six inch pipe in it and where the center of rotation is and we're gonna use a wizard in the program to accomplish that, super easy. And then lastly, the third item, we're gonna set the program origin at the rear of the pipe. So let's go ahead and start with the procedure of how to relocate the homing bracket. For this operation, you're gonna need a 19 millimeter wrench. Let's go to the rear of the machine and let's use it. I'm gonna loosen up the bolts and take out the part. This is the homing bracket right here, and it bolts onto the rail, and it has a blade on it which a non-contact reed switch will approach this blade, and once it picks it up, it will stop moving, and then it will set home. We are going to adjust this up and down that rail until we can get the torch close to the end of the pipe. We don't have to be perfectly at the end of the pipe because, remember, we've got about an inch and a half to work with. Now, that bracket uses a piece. Let me see. Hopefully, the autofocus will pick it up a piece of segmented spear, uh, spur gear, and it's got a hole machined on the bottom of it. And the idea is place the spur gear on top of the bolt and then run the bolt up until it tries to pick the spur gear up. That will kind of keep it in position. Let me go back here to the back of the machine. Now I'm gonna do a cheat. I'm gonna go ahead and rotate the control panel because I'm gonna need to hit the home button. Once again, check out the video on how to do it. It's super simple. Now, before I do that, I'm going to go ahead. Remember, I ran it all the way back until it homed. I'm going to go ahead and measure from here to here, and I've got about six and a half inches. So what I'm going to do is I am going to place the homing bracket onto the frame, and I'm going to adjust it back about six inches. I will take a picture of that and show it to you. Let's go ahead and put the homing bracket back into the machine. Ba -da -ba -ba. Got to run a bolt back down. All righty. And I'm going to measure from the front edge of that blade on the homing bracket to the edge of the, of the um, reed switch. Okay, I'm six inches right there. Now I'm going to go ahead and re-tighten up my bolt. Is that where I want it? Let me move it over a little bit more. How about right there? All righty, I'm going to re-tighten that. The reason we use a homing, adjustable homing switch like this is because there are many, many attachments that we plan on bringing out for the XR6, and this gives us the versatility to alter that home position and use as much of the material. I don't know if you saw a dragonfly just fly by me. Okay, I'm going to go here on the screen, 
and I am going to select the home menu and I am going to click home Y only. The Y axis is running this way up and down the machine. So let me go ahead and say yes. Here she comes. Okay, looks like to me we got to go a little bit further, maybe a couple inches. Now this, this time I am not going to measure it. I kind of know what's going on. I can kind of eyeball it. Let me break it loose. All righty. Now you do want to snug this thing down pretty good when you put it in the machine. All right, let's back her up just a little bit more here. I have no idea why I'm being so clumsy. There we go. I think we're going to come back about this far here. Let's run it back up. Yep, now we're looking good. And then we'll tighten it up one more time. There we go. All right, let's hit the home drop down. We'll select the Y axis and we'll do it again. There we go. Now, you should be able to see, looks like we're about a quarter of an inch away from the end of this pipe. We're done. We've homed the machine. Let's go ahead and move it away. Now we are ready to go. So if we were to wrap it back towards the end, she will not contact our torch. We've done that right here. Let me go ahead and rotate the screen back around and then we will use the wizard in order to find the center of the pipe. What we've got to do now is allow the XR6 to determine the size of the pipe and the center of rotation. To do this, we're going to use one of the wizards in the control panel that will automate that process. The idea is I will move the head to the center of the pipe. Doesn't have to be perfect, just eyeball close. And then I'm going to lower it to within one inch or less above the pipe. Now before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and take the scotch bright and I'm going to rub the top of the tubing and a little bit off to each side, about three inches on this. You'll see why in a minute. And the reason I'm doing that is this routine requires an electrical connection between the electrode on the torch and the material itself. Well, if you have a lot of built up rust, you may not get a good electrical connection, at which case the magnetic head will disengage off the machine, stop the machine. All righty, let's go ahead and move that over. Going to move over to the middle here. And like I said, I'm just eyeballing this. This isn't anything that's super critical. I'm within one inch. Let me go over here now and I will run the wizard, show you how I do that. I'm going to go up here to plasma and I am going to go down to wizards. Now over here we have different wizards. We have a leveling wizard, round tube, rectangular, things like that. We're going to pick the round tube wizard. I need to add the OD here, 6.625 inches, and I click Generate. Now we'll go back to Plasma, and I'm going to run this routine. Let me go ahead and move the camera a little bit so you can see exactly what it's doing. It's touched off on the near side, looking for the far side. It's going to spin the pipe and it's going to look for the top. Okay, we're finished doing the, um, the location routine. The last thing we need to do before we can actually run this program is tell the XR12 where the end of the part is. In Camelot, that's the way it's kicking out code. It's going to reference off the end of the tube. So to do that, let's just go ahead and move the head in a little bit. A little bit more. Okay, there we go. I'm about a quarter of an inch inside from the end of the tube. Now I'm going to walk over to the control panel and I'm under quick work offsets. I'm going to make sure I have my primary head selected because that was the torch and I'm going to click Y0. Now right up here you could see that Y has been set to zero, which means we are good to go to run this program. The machine is ready to cut it. Let's go over to the control panel and load up the program that we're going to be cutting. So I'm going to go up to file and I am going to import an NGC and I'm going to select my part, a six inch both ends cut. Now another thing I need to do here is I got to go down to plasma configuration. Even though there's numbers here, we're going to reset it. I'm going to select it and I need to select the material, the wall thickness, and um, also the consumables. Now in the 
Camelot program, I told it 65 amps. I went back, changed it to 45. As a general rule, I like to use the smallest possible nozzle I can. And for quarter inch, that turns out to be a 45 amp shielded. So I apologize for saying 65 amps in there. I changed it over to 45. Anyway, we're gonna say, okay. And that will populate this lower left with all of our material settings for the machine. Now, another thing I do, normally rapids are full or 100%. Generally, when I get to the larger pipe sizes, I will bring them down to 50%. And that is something that we will be adding into the software later to where Camelot will actually kick that information out. Okay, at this point, if I hit the run button right here, we're cutting, but I want to do something different. Um, since I'm cutting on both ends of the pipe, I'm going to turn on dry run and then I'm going to hit run. Let me reposition the cutter and I can tell you why I've done that. I mean, I'm sorry, the camera and I can tell you why I've done that. Okie dokie, let me go ahead and hit the run button. Now remember, I've got dry run selected. Let's see what, we, let's see, let's see what happens here. Okay, we're rotating into position. Now we're going to go ahead and run the program but we're not actually cutting metal. So the question is why I'd want to do that. And the reason is once we get to the far end of the tube down there, I want to make sure that we're not going to get into these jaws. So when I'm doing a program to where we are doing that, I will typically run dry run mode before I run the actual program. Now, let's go back to the screen over here. Hopefully you can see this good. I am going to go ahead and speed everything up. We'll go back to feed and rapids. We're gonna to go to 200% on feed, back to 100% on rapids. This is a slot we're cutting right there. You can see the coolant pouring out of the tube there. And as I've mentioned numerous times, there is no substitute for coolant running through your workpiece in order to increase the quality of cut. All right, look at that. That looks pretty darn good. We're near the end, but it looks like we've got, you know, maybe two and a half inches, two, a little over two inches of clearance. So that means I can go ahead and stop this and run the program for real. Let's start by turning off dry run, and then we'll hit the run button. There we go. This cut's going to take, I believe, a little over a minute, maybe two minutes. I'm going to go ahead and let it run all the way out so you can see everything. There's our first cut. Just figured I'd knock that piece of metal out of the way. Probably should have used a stick. There's a slot. Now remember I turned down the rapids to 50%. I like to do that when I'm going to the larger pipe. There we go. Now what's gonna happen here, as she rotates around, the pipe is gonna fall when it actually finishes being cut, but you're gonna notice that that bracket down there is actually gonna catch it. This is one of the reasons why I don't like Pinocchio machines, because you can never get this kind of material utilization out of one. There we go, getting ready to drop. And that's it. Let me go ahead and move the head out of the way. We'll come over here. I'm gonna control shift. And there we go. You can see that it's dropped a little bit, not a whole lot. And you can tell that it's 
Well, it actually didn't even drop on the, on the V, but if it did, it would not have been a big deal. All right, let me go ahead and pop this thing away from the, the remnant and we'll do our closing statements. Okay, we've done it. We've cut the big pipe. We were left with a little bit less than two inches of remnant material. I could have got easily another inch closer, but I like to stay a little bit away from the jaws just you know, for that little bit of safety right there. Um, there's really not a whole lot else to talk about, so stay tuned for future videos. I'm trying to do a lot of them. I'm getting ready to shoot a video to where we're cutting the six inch square using the ring system. Then I'm gonna shoot a drive shaft video. I got a lot of videos to shoot on the operation of the XR6 and XR12. So if you enjoyed it, go ahead, hit the like button, subscribe if you wanna be notified uh, or click the notification button. Um, I'm trying to bang out about three a week or something like that. Anyway, I really appreciate you for taking your time out and viewing this video. Have a great day. Goodbye.